Hello, this is Stephanie Hardy of the Hardy Wrestling Podcast, and I just want to start the show off by saying that this episode is going to be dedicated to many lives um, that are impacted and have been impacted in the last few weeks. Um, Last Wednesday and Thursday, the wrestling world was shocked and saddened by the loss and the passing of Shannon Spurl, who was professionally known in the wrestling world as Daphne. It's common knowledge now how she passed away. But I personally wanted to take this time to say that if you are ever feeling or thinking that you are alone and that no one cares about you, please reach out and get the help that you absolutely need. There are so many amazing mental health resources and so many Um, places where you can go, where someone will listen to you talk about the issues that you are having or issues that you just need some assistance with. There are so many out there and I just don't want to let make you feel, I don't ever want anyone to feel that they are by themselves in this world. I know this world can get real crazy sometimes. It can turn us topsy-turvy. But the thing about the dark moments in life is that They are all mostly temporary. Um, Please always remember that there is always a light at the end of the tunnel, that you are beauty, you are strength. But most importantly, always remember that you matter so much to this world and that the world needs a person just like you. Somebody needs you. And needs to see you and experience you just as you are, imperfect in all of your ways, but still very much vital and beautiful in your own beautiful way. So if you ever need me, I am always a message away. Um, You can always find my show. You can always find me on Instagram at Hardy Wrestling Podcast or Message me on Twitter at Hardy WrestlePod and just reach out if you ever need anything. This episode is also dedicated to the thousands of lives that were lost 20 years ago in those horrible attacks on September the 11th, 2001. There are so many families and so many friends that were affected by those events and so many many nameless people that we will never know who are affected by those events as well due to thoughts and due to so many ideals that were adapted based off of the actions of a few and honestly all of it reverberates and goes back to that day but the most important thing is is that we learn to love each other through these hard times and to stand up through these hard times and continue to have joy even in the most difficult of moments. So to anyone who is from those places that were directly affected by those events in New York, in Washington, D.C., and in Pennsylvania, please know that I am always praying and I am always loving and keeping my thoughts with you guys every single day and that this episode specifically is dedicated to y'all you guys picked up yourselves and walked through the most immense tragedy that anybody could ever imagine in this country and you were able to pick yourselves up and move forward consistently and been doing it for years now and I have nothing but love and respect for every last one of you And to all of my friends who are fellow podcasters as well in wrestling and in other areas, this is a personal I love you to you guys because you guys have been nothing but good to me and nothing but supportive as well. So thank you. And I love you guys so very much. And with that in mind, this is the Hardy Wrestling Podcast. I've got a good show for you guys. And... Much love to everyone who's been affected by the losses of the past few weeks and over the past couple of years.
All right. So now we have, we are here and I'm so happy to be doing this episode. Um, after a couple of weeks off last week was my birthday week and then the week before um the weekend before I was in St. Louis for NWA weekend which I'll talk a little bit more about later but now we're on news and gossipish and there's a ton of stuff to get to so we're gonna start with Damian Priest teasing Triple H about a Wrestlemania match so in an interview with Alistair McGeorge of Metro Um, Damian Priest mentioned teasing Triple H about facing him at WrestleMania earlier this year. Um, He said, quote, I make jokes from time to time like, hey, Mania, Hunter didn't have a match. And that was the first time all these legends or none of them were on the show. I make jokes from time to time. Well, he said, I was I was like, I mean, did you bring your gear? Because you can have a match. I'm right here. He started laughing and said, you're on a list of people that have asked me that. I was like, I bet I can imagine. He gets it all the time by guys being like, hey, you want to work? You want to wrestle? Um, now, of course, this didn't happen. Um, but he also went on to say um, that in the future, he could very well face Triple H, Shawn Michaels, Edge, or Kane. He said, I mean, I wish I get to face them all. I still hold out hope, you know, especially in this business. Never say never. I think the closest one that I know that there's a chance and we've already kind of had an interaction at the Rumble is Edge. Obviously, Kane, we had a bit of an interaction, but I'm not satisfied. I need a lot more of that. Those feelings just standing across from those guys. Super cool, super cool, super cool. Now, mind you, to me... All of this is amazing. Of course, Damian Priest is our um, United States champion as of SummerSlam time, which I'm really happy about. Congratulations to him. But can you even imagine like having Damian Priest face Triple H, who's basically like the father of NXT, who basically helped house him, you know, in a sense, and it's kind of like the papa the Papa Bear of all the NXT people, like that would be really crazy, but it would be very intriguing. And him versus um, Edge would be really cool too. So of course, you know, this year at WrestleMania, he was in a tag, before he was the United States champion, he was in a tag team match um, with his partner, um, Puerto Rican rap star, Bad Bunny against The Miz and John Morrison. So that was a cool moment for him to be able to tag with someone who he has um previous history with in terms of bad bunny and their ancestry um and just having that in common and then facing two people who are sort of like veterans in the business now like the miz and john morrison so that was really cool and i'm pretty sure the future will continue to be bright for someone like damian priest so that was cool Also in the news, The Undertaker and The New Day are starring in an interactive Netflix movie. Um, WWE and Netflix announced Wednesday that a new movie starring The Undertaker and The New Day, that's Xavier Woods, Kofi Kingston, and Big E, will debut on Netflix on October the 5th. So according to Polygon's Petrana Radulovic, um, Netflix described the movie entitled Escape the Undertaker as an interactive film in which New Day must attempt to escape the Undertaker's mansion. The Undertaker has set up supernatural challenges to trip them up, and it is up to the viewer to help guide Kofi, Xavier, and Big E to freedom. And mind you, I think this is a cool way to sort of utilize The Undertaker, who's not really, basically, who's basically retired from wrestling now, you could say, Um, because we haven't seen any appearances from him this year at all so it's safe to say that this is pretty that you know he's done with wrestling right so I think this is cool to sort of keep you know him sort of in the loop with wrestling but not so much so and I also think this is cool for the new day because you get to expose them to a new audience in terms of the Netflix audience that likes to do interactive films and stuff and Netflix has sort of you know dabbled in that before with their movie called um I think it was Black Mirror Bandersnatch and that was very um interesting I really liked that um interactive film where you could control the outcome um in different circumstances or different scenes of the movie so I think that'll be interesting and a lot of people on social media I did see were kind of feeling some type of way about it um in terms of the Undertaker's personal 
um, politics or personal opinions that have been sort of put out there, but not really full on, um, or at least something that's been insinuated with him and then controlling, you know, these three black men in a haunted house. But I mean, maybe, maybe in some cases, this is where maybe we should just back off a little bit with a lot of that and just, you know, just enjoy it for what it is, which is an interactive film. So maybe it's just a fun thing and maybe we should just chill because indeed there are bigger fish to fry in wrestling when it comes to diversity but i'll get into that later um also in the news we have john moxley who is thrilled with the success of aew so of course you know once upon a time he was the aew champion and he made his debut john moxley made his debut um two years ago at double or nothing 2019 so he appeared on cincy 360 with rick uccino and tony pike um, and he was explaining his mindset when he signed with AEW compared to now. Because, of course, um, AEW, Dynamite, and Rampage were both set in Cincinnati, Ohio. And that's where John Moxley and also Brian Pillman Jr. is from. So he's quoted as saying, Yeah, it's crazy to see when all of this was just like an idea. It's like, really? Wow. It seemed almost unrealistic, but to take the gamble to come here and be like, well, you know, what if you guys are doing that? What I want to be a part of that, like, so maybe we'll fall flat on our face and all look stupid. But and this will be a big disaster. But if it was successful, that would be really cool because that's what wrestling needs. And just looking at how two years, two and a half years later, I don't think it could have gone any better. So yeah like he held the aew um title for 277 days before um dropping it to kenny omega who is currently still the aew champion as it stands and the champion of many other places as well um so it's pretty interesting you know to see how he's sort of been helping with the evolution of AEW and it's clear that they believe in him as a talent and being one of the faces of the brand so it's really cool and he had a pretty good match um with Minoru Suzuki and and Satoshi Kojima these past few weeks in terms of all out and on dynamite so it's pretty clear that this is you know becoming a very beneficial for him so that's cool and speaking of Kenny Omega, um, he was ranked number one on the PWI um, 500 list that they put out every year, of course. And then they also do one for the women, too. And that's set to come out next year. But he was listed as number one. And this caused quite a controversy on Twitter because a lot of people felt like Roman Reigns should be number one, even though he was number two, um, because they felt like all of his character work and his wrestling abilities have, you know, changed and evolved and gotten way better within the past year, especially in this pandemic year. And everything that he's done in terms of working with his family in term like with his cousins the usos and with paul Heyman, has been amazing and he's held the universal title consistently for almost over a year now so the argument could be made that he could have been number one but at the same time you have kenny omega who was you know who won the AEW world championship on top of holding multiple titles in other like in other promotions as well so you can't really argue against Kenny being number one either, but you know, it's kind of hard. <laughs> Needless to say, it's kind of hard to say um, who should be number one and who should be number two and all of that. But congratulations to Kenny for making it to be number one. And also congratulations to everybody who made it on the 500 list, including Trisha Dora, who is the highest ranked woman on the list, and Masha Slamovich, who I had the pleasure of meeting during NWA weekend and interviewing with Women's Wrestling Talk. Please check out that interview. Um, she was ranked on the list as well, number 420. So that was really cool to see people who I've actually met, you know, be on the list. And Sahara Seven was on the list too, I believe. Um, or maybe she was on the um the black the black wrestling 500 list i can't really remember there's a lot of lists that roll around in wrestling but congratulations to everybody who got on a list this year so yes let's cover that um also in the news something that was unexpected that happened was the fact that triple h um was making a is expected to make a full recovery after undergoing a heart procedure right so 
um last week he had surgery you know on his heart because he had a cardiac event and this was announced on um ww.com they say paul laveau aka triple h who's the um executive vice president of wwe and global talent strategy and development um underwent a successful procedure last week at yale new haven hospital following a cardiac event the the episode was caused by a genetic heart issue and paul is expected to make a full recovery and then no further details were offered on his condition so um i'm glad that even though this is a genetic heart issue that they were able to do surgery on it and everything is okay so we're sending thoughts prayers and good wishes towards him and his recovery and just hoping that he takes it easy i know being um the executive vice president of global talent strategy and development and also sometimes being a superstar on top of being a husband and a dad may not be easy um a lot of the time so here's hoping that he just takes it easy a bit and just slows down and then um while he was going through his recovery mustafa ali was on twitter and he shared a really nice story about triple h he said when i was on 205 live i had to relocate to orlando my wife who was pregnant at the time stayed in chicago about a month before the due date i asked hunter if i could visit home for a week Hunter told me, don't visit, move back home and be a father. Hunter is a good man. So in the midst of so much that goes on in the press in terms of how um, people behind the scenes at WWE treat people and stuff like that, it's nice to know that they can, that they do indeed have human moments and that they're not just, you know, complete buttholes as sometimes we sort of make them out to be sometimes when it comes to reports and stuff. So that was a really nice story because Mustafa didn't have to share that, but he did. So that was really nice. And Mustafa has a beautiful family as well. His wife is gorgeous. His kids are gorgeous. Like he, you know, they're just a gorgeous family. So, you know, um, blessings to them. Also in the news, Kevin Owens is um, WWE contract is set to expire in January of 2022. So according to Sean Ross Sapp on Fightful Select, shout out to them because they actually um, featured my interview with Awesome Kong um, on their Twitter page, which and on their website, which absolutely floored me and made me feel happy inside. Um, So his so according to Sean Ross Sapp. Kevin Owens' contract reportedly expires at the beginning of next year. So he said, we've learned from a WWE official that WWE restructured several contracts ahead of the pandemic. And for whatever reason, Kevin Owens' deal was changed to expire in um, January of 2022. We were not told of any additional terms of the deal or why specifically it was shortened. We'll work to find out if any other deals were adjusted. As um, Aaron Rift of No DQ noted, Kevin Owens told TVA Sports in May 2018 that he had recently signed a five-year deal with WWE, so the latest report represents a significant change in his contract structure. The latest Owens report drops on the same day that he deleted a tweet that may have alluded to a reunion with some of his formal, former stable members who are now in AEW. And this was further explained by Mark Middleton of Wrestling Inc., He said the speculation began when Owens tweeted the coordinates to Mount Rushmore in South Dakota. He then changed the location to his in his Twitter bio to almost there, which is seen as a reference to the Mount Rushmore coordinates, which have since been deleted from his Twitter feed. Mount Rushmore is the name of a stable Owens was in with Adam Cole and AEW World Tag Team Champions, the Young Bucks in 2013 through to through 2014. Owens ended up leaving the stable when he signed with WWE in 2014. He left the group with a triple super kick from Adam Cole and the Young Bucks. And Owens has been with WWE since 2014. Um, And he's a three-time United States champion and two-time Intercontinental champion. And he was a former Universal champion and an NXT champion as well. So it would be huge if he actually did wind up wound up if he wound up restructuring his entire contract you know to help him leave because it seems like now a lot of people are finding their unhappiness in wwe and i don't know if it's because of the president nick khan or if it's because of how people are just you know they're just not feeling their best in wwe so 
when they want to feel happy again or whatever and they want to feel like they're being heard they'll go to AEW and it seems like AEW is becoming that place where people are now going like even with CM Punk being there with um all the indie sort of you could say the indie wrestling icons like the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega being there and now Adam Cole who left NXT to go there and join the elite again it's like one can only wonder you know with Kevin Owens's history with them if he would also want to join them as well and also with Ruby Soho who is on the women's division now too so it's you know AEW just basically has a great shot. They have a bunch of shots in their arms, along with the talent that they already have, you know, that they were originally came in with and stuff. They're acquiring so many people. And it's almost like you at first you didn't want to believe it was to the detriment of WWE, but now it's it's beginning to be shifted that way. And it's just strange. I personally don't want to see Kevin Owens leave, but honestly, you don't see him on television that much anymore. So if he did leave, it wouldn't necessarily surprise me. So, but like I said, we'll have to see. Um, also in the news, we have they tweeted out, I believe it was either yesterday or today that Gable Stevenson, who won um, the Olympic gold medal for the United States in wrestling, has officially signed an exclusive deal with the WWE. So that's really cool. And congratulations to him. And a lot of people were saying, oh, well, he's going he's not going to do anything but become the next Kurt Angle. And I don't think that's accurate because only Kurt Angle could be Kurt Angle because only Kurt Angle could win a gold medal for the United States in wrestling with a broken freaking neck. Gable Stevenson did not do that. He did not wrestle with a broken freaking neck. He wrestled with all of his bones intact, as far as I know. So <laughs> he's doing okay. Plus, not to mention, you have wrestlers um, who are training that type of wrestling, like Dolph Ziggler, even though he didn't go to the Olympics, he was still training wrestling, like in high school and in college. He definitely, you know, wasn't an, a next Kurt Angle. Kofi Kingston wasn't a next Kurt Angle. He used to wrestle in high school as well. Um, and you definitely can say that Jason Jordan and Chad Gable would never be the next Kurt Angles either, even though they had a whole tag team called American Alpha. And you can see all the similarities and how they wrestled, but they were never considered the next Kurt Angle either. So it's not fair to sort of, you know, pin our comparisons to Kurt Angle on Gable Stevenson just because he also won a gold medal just like Kurt Angle did. So... And then his brother is also assigning it to um, the PC as well. So maybe they'll have a tag team and they'll be like a family duo. But hey, who knows what's, you know, what could happen. But congratulations to him. Um, two more things in the news. <laughs> the Miz um, is has been announced as a part of the new cast for Dancing with the Stars Wednesday. So Dancing with the Stars is scheduled to premiere on ABC on September the 20th. And, and it's really interesting how the Miz is, you know, the type of person who can represent WWE on multiple brands of TV shows with, um, movies and guest starring roles on television shows, his own reality show. And now he's going to be on another reality show in Dancing with the Stars. And he's just the right person to do it. He's going to be joining Suni Lee, who, um, was also a gold medalist in gymnastics, I think. Um, and NBA guard Iman Shumpert, you know, on the cast as well. So this is going to be interesting and I think it's going to be cool. Maybe he might, you know, do a fantastic job on the show. Maybe he'll flop. Who knows? But, you know, I'm pretty sure we'll know about it because WWE will tell us about it. And what's so sad is Dancing with the Stars usually comes on on Monday nights and Monday nights I'm watching wrestling. So yeah here's hoping he goes far and if he wins the mirror ball trophy that would be great too so hey and it also depends on who his partner is too so yeah congratulations to the Miz for making it on dance with the stars um another thing that I will talk about that made ripples in on wrestling twitter was the lack of um prominent african-american or black stars on top in AEW and this started um, a little bit before AEW's All Out pay-per-view event, but then it got even, um, it started to reverberate a whole lot more. 
um, on Twitter as the event wound up going forward because um, the only people of color who won anything or were featured prominently um, in a match on AEW's All Out were the Lucha Brothers. And they wound up beating the Young Bucks in a pretty crazy um, action-packed tag team match in a cage um, for the AEW World Tag Team titles. And that's great for them, and that's amazing for Hispanic culture, especially with their entrance and stuff. But when it comes to Black wrestlers, it seems like AEW has been on the struggle bus with um, featuring Black stars prominently on their um, television shows. But you'll feature them prominent mostly on shows like AEW Dark and AEW Dark Elevation. And that's not necessarily a bad thing because, of course, you know, you have exposure on YouTube and you want, you know, to get as many eyes as possible on that brand or on that, you know, part of your brand. But at the same time, when you started AEW, you sort of, when you were going on all your press junkets, you were going forth and talking about how you're going to be different in terms of diversity. And you use Brandy Rhodes, um, who is the, um, I believe she's the, she's not the executive vice president, but she's like I forgot what her position is in AEW but at the same time it's like she is in a higher position and all of that but yet at the same time you know it's like you have people like Big Swole who hasn't really been on television but should have been on television with her three strikes match against Diamante and you have people like Sunny Kiss who we hadn't seen in a while who who showed up on dark or dark elevation to beef with Joey Janela and stuff. And I understand everybody can't make it on television, but at the same time, if you're going to prominently feature, um, so many people who aren't of color, then you should also, you know, feature the people of color just the same, not just on your YouTube shows, but also on your television shows. And the idea that we don't support black wrestlers is absolutely ridiculous because, I am actually a part of a community that actively supports all wrestlers, but definitely African-American wrestlers or wrestlers of any African descent. So we do support them and there is an audience for it. So as long as they, AEW keeps not showing them, we're going to keep showing up, you know, for these black wrestlers and keep, you know, raising our voices until they are heard and until changes are made. And that's all for news and gossipish. And now I'm going to talk about my experience at NWA Weekend in St. Louis with NWA Empower and NWA 73. All right. So I wanted to take this time to talk about my experience at NWA Weekend. Um, about two weekends ago it feels like it's been less than that but yeah like two weekends ago um I went to St. Louis to join um my colleagues from Women's Wrestling Talk the number one women's wrestling show on the planet um TK Trinidad um and Emily May and um Ella Jackson shout out to her and I met a bunch of new people as well in the podcasting world And we were all together for NWA weekend. This was a historic weekend in St. Louis um, because Saturday was going to be NWA's first all-female pay-per-view in power, um, which was executive produced by Mickey James and also helped produced by Jazz, um, the iconic wrestler who I had the pleasure of meeting a couple months ago at Belladonna. And um, I got to have an interview with her as well and by Medusa and Gail Kim. Um, So this was a great event to be a part of and to actually see take place. And then on that Sunday, you had um, NWA 73, which was historic in and of itself because you had a lot of, you had, you know, a few women's matches. You had Mickey James fighting Kylie Ray, and that was a good match. And um, there were and then there was this really big money match between Nick Al Aldis, um, who was the NWA World Heavyweight Champion against Trevor Murdoch, who was from the Missouri area, who was from Missouri. And he was fighting to sort of bring honor um, back to his name in terms of his family and stuff and wanting to sort of win as a tribute to Harley Race, who helped train him and Nick Aldis as well. 
And you can feel the history in the air because um, at the Chase Hotel is where a lot of wrestling events used to take place. They used to call it Wrestling at the Chase. And they even had the old ring bell that they used to use. And when I tell you this ring bell was huge, like they had people, you know, walking up and actually ringing it. And it was just one of the coolest things I had ever seen. And the ballroom, um, the Karasin ballroom where the event was like was at, like they had the NWA ring set up. And I felt like I was looking at a point of history because something that me and my dad used to do a lot was like watch older videos and older clips of wrestling um, on different DVDs and stuff. And they would show NWA and they would have that ring there. And just to be in the same room with it was just like, whoa, like it was just insane. And then to see people like, you know, Ric Flair come back for NWA 73 and have him stand in that ring and talk about everything that he had ever done in NWA. Like that was amazing. Like, and his entire speech and everything to be in the room with him, you know, and hear him tell all these stories and stuff. It was just really amazing. And then to see him congratulate um, Trevor Murdoch once he did win um, that title from Nick Aldis was just absolutely amazing. So it was a pretty historic event to be to be a part of. And that was like, I will never forget that for as long as I live. And then to be in the same room with so many people who I had watched on TV, you know, since I had came up with like JTG was there and he was in a battle royal and he came up short and he wound up losing to this really tall guy. And I can't remember his name, but he was really tall and very imposing, but he lost. And I was so disappointed because I love JTG and I've always loved crime time. Shout out to JTG. Um, and, um, rest in peace to Shad Gaspard. He's a hero. Um, I was just just so enthralled to be there and even at Empower when they were watching um, Camille um, who is the NWA Women's Champion fight um, Layla Hirsch from AEW legit Layla Hirsch like Strictly Business actually came out and sat like that's the faction that she's in Um, they actually came out and sat right in front of us at the table and they just they smelled like so much masculinity like you know how you smell a whole bunch of cologne on a man like that's what all three of those dudes smell like and they were just sitting in front of us and just rooting on Camille and it was just like the weirdest thing because I had never really like the closest I had ever been to a wrestler like at an event was number one when I was in NXT live and all those people you know were fighting and they kept hitting the barricades where we were and where I met Ember Moon and stuff when she was NXT Women's Champion. And like when AJ Styles walked up the steps when he was beefing with, I think it was Daniel Bryan, if I'm not mistaken. And he was walking up the steps, you know, and he walked right past me and my boyfriend. Like that was just the most amazing thing ever. And when I met Ric Flair at Comic-Con. So just the idea of, you know, all of this happening, you know, just right in front of me was just amazing. Like it was just really cool. Um, and then to sort of see them walk back and forth and just look like normal people, was just amazing. Like, um, but the most amazing stuff not only just happened, you know, during the event and everything, it was also during the media, um, point, which is basically what I was a part of since women's wrestling talk is, uh, we're basically like the female Avengers of women's wrestling coverage, um, and wrestling coverage as a whole, um, I was there with them to do media and TK being our fearless leader trusted me um, to interview a lot of the wrestlers. And I had never done anything like this before. I had never been, you know, at a red at a red carpet kind of situation. I've never really interviewed people, you know, face to face before. I've only ever done it, you know, on video or on audio um, since I've started this podcast. But having actually interviewed, you know, like being able to have that opportunity was scary, but it meant the world to me once I found my groove. So I interviewed Tyrus first, um, who is the NWA television champion, if I'm not mistaken. I interviewed him um, that Saturday and I was really nervous, but he was very helpful with me um, and understanding of the fact that, you know, I was there and he really, you know, appreciated it. And that felt really good. 
and just being able to see all of these people sort of walk backstage you know where the room was and seeing you know seeing them you know just not even I don't I don't want to sound weird but just seeing them do all the regular stuff that reg that everybody else do was just really really cool like just eating and just being themselves and they were just really nice you know towards the fan the fans and stuff during fan fest which was um basically what I was at and just being getting you know tips from Emily and um just tips from Emily and tips from TK and Ella and so many people who had done stuff like this before Samira and even um Phil Lindsay like who had been on the show previously a couple episodes ago seeing him you know face to face was awesome like that was another amazing part of the weekend was getting to meet people who I follow online and who follow me I got to meet Sam from know the ropes podcast and we've been following each other like all this time and so to actually meet him was just like oh my god it's you like and he had on his mask and I was just like oh my god it's you like this is so cool and then I got to meet up with we love wrestling like that was so cool too and seeing him freak out about TK that was cool too and I was just so happy to and I got to meet the connecting people through wrestling guy like I don't know if you've if you've ever watched wrestling there's this there's this one person who has this sign but it's not a sign it's like a frame like a giant picture frame that's cardboard and it's yellow and red letters it's written like connecting people through wrestling and I got to meet him and take a picture like it's on my Instagram and my Twitter if you haven't seen it go check out those pictures it was so cool to meet everybody like ah it was so cool so um so I'm ho- I'm more than sure that some that more stuff like that will happen um and then it was also cool to see so many people who I've seen wrestle before at Belladonna division um as well because Sahara 7 you know she was in the tag team with Renee Michelle um in the tag team tournament for the NWA women's tag team titles right and I had just seen her a couple weeks ago and I was just them a couple weeks ago and I was just like oh my god y'all are here you know and it was just amazing to see all these people, you know, a part of this. And then I got to discover new people who I'd never really heard of before, like Tootie Lynn. She's from St. Louis. And when she came out for that, uh, for the NWA um, Women's Tournament Cup Battle Royal, like, no, not the Battle Royal, it was like an elimination match. She came out and, oh, Everybody in St. Louis lost their minds for her. And I was just so happy to see her have that moment and just to see how fierce she is as a competitor and how she was actually the like she was like in the final two with Chelsea Green, who and Chelsea Green is like one of the most, you know, one of the most experienced wrestlers, you know, women's like in women's wrestling as a whole. And for her to actually like be like number two with her was just like amazing. I was rooting for her to win, but Chelsea Green won. And that was great for her too, you know, seeing as the year, the past few, the past year that she had just had where she was just let go from WWE and then seeing her now, you know, with this cup and having the opportunity um to face Camille for the NWA women's title at NWA 73 that was a great match and everything but just seeing all of that take place and seeing all these new stars and everything that who I had never seen like sky blue and everything like that was amazing and just getting to meet you know a lot of these women and talk to them and see how important participating in something like Empower was was just so cool and so that next Sunday was NWA Fan Fest for Empower for the Women. And that was really where I was having the time of my life because I got to interview Mickey James um, and I got to talk to her about, you know, where she sees women's wrestling going, you know, how important it was for her to have and produce an event like Empower um, and just how amazing it was for her to be in a thing like this. And, um... And I was just so happy to even talk to her because this is like Mickey James. Like, I remember when she first debuted in the WWE and her famous feud with um, Trish Stratus and all that. And it's just like, man, like, this is her and she's right in front of me. And she was so nice that she gave me like maybe a thousand hugs. It was just the most amazing thing. And I, 
I couldn't even get over that. And then even talking to Melina, who I had seen Russell so many times before too, she was really nice as well. Like all of these interviews are on um, Women's Wrestling Talk on our website um, and on our YouTube channel. Please check those out. Um, and then interviewing Awesome Kong, who had retired um, at NWA Empower with Gail Kim, who she had, you know, famous run-ins with in, um, in Impact and stuff. Like, she retired after coming to her rescue, you know, because she was alone in the ring with, um, Taryn Terrell and Genocide, who I had the, pro- the, the privilege of meeting and interviewing as well. Like, being a part of that and seeing her, you know, retire and seeing her and Gail Kim have that moment and then interviewing her afterward. And then the next week finding out that she and I have the same birthday. Oh my God, you don't understand how amazing that was. And just being able to talk to her because like that, oh, like that was just amazing. And I feel like I'm using the word amazing a lot, but that's just how it was. Like, it was just great. And then interviewing, um... Melina, who had had her match with Deanna Parato, who's like, you know, the Impact Knockouts champion. Um, and just seeing her, you know, be dominant and everything. And just seeing Melina, you know, fight, you know, and seeing my friends Ella and Samira, you know, and the hosts of Ring the Bells, whose name escapes me right now. I'm so sorry if you listen to this and I can't remember your name right now. But seeing them be her paparazzi for her entrance was really cool. And Melina has still got it, y'all. Like, she really does still have it. Like, I want to see more from her um, in terms of wrestling. Like, she definitely still has the smoke. And I'm really happy that she had that moment with Deanna Parasso, who is the future. Like, and seeing how good of a wrestler she is and seeing, you know, how she's about to beef with Mickey James now. Like, that is just the most interesting thing on the planet. And it made me realize, you know, there's so much of wrestling that I don't get a chance to watch but it makes me want to pay more attention to it and it was just so amazing so it was just really cool and just just getting to meet so many people in wrestling media you know who are trying to make a difference you know from where they're from because there's this one guy I met um who is who is I believe a photographer and an interviewer um, from Puerto Rico and how important, you know, wrestling is to him and preserving the actual wrestling history from the from the perspective of people of color in terms of Puerto Ricans and the people from Dominican Republic, like Marty Bell, um, who is now the NWA women's tag team champion, along with Allison K with the Hex. Like it was something that was really important to her. And she mentioned that in our interview together and stuff. And even, you know, during the show, during their backstage interviews and stuff and getting to talk to them was really cool. Like you can see all of these interviews and I got to talk to Jazz, who makes me really nervous. Like she makes she made me the most nervous out of everybody. I don't know. She just makes me nervous. (laughs) But um, just talking to everybody um, and all those great women, you know, in that event it's just it would just meant the world to me because I'm just starting like I just started this podcast just last year and you know it's insane for me to be in the same room or in the same conversation as people like TK um Trinidad and Emily May Heller because they've been doing this for a long time like Emily is like a full-on producer and an interviewer on different shows and stuff and TK like she has like a thousand hustles And, you know, and she's a great host and just being in the same conversation, you know, as them or even with them just means a lot to me because I used to watch them on YouTube on After Buzz television all the time years ago, like before I graduated from college, I used to watch them all the time and listen to their opinions about wrestling like all the time. So to be in the same conversation with these people, to even be in the same room with them and get tips from them and them telling me to smile and not be so nervous and all this other stuff like it just meant the world to me and to be able to be in the same room with all these people who you know I've grown to admire and love and appreciate and people who I've watched on television like and just learning so much about it um which and being a part of wrestling history in that way it will always resonate with me and it makes me feel like there is so much more that I have to offer you know and in terms of being a wrestling journalist, a podcaster, um, 
interviewer commentator person like there is so much that I have to offer and it made me feel really good you know that this is something that I'm a part of and I'm hoping that whatever it is that you're doing in your life, whether it be, you know, something new that you just started or something that you've been doing for a couple of years that you kind of just don't want to give up on at all. Like, I hope whatever it is makes you feel happy the way that I feel happy and fulfilled right now with um, participating in that weekend. And I feel like my head and my heart are still stuck there. Um, But um, I was just really happy to have that experience and to see those two events and to meet everybody who I had met. Um, and actually, you know, network with people and stuff like, oh, I've just been really busy (laughs) with commentating, um, for Belladonna 2, for Genesis 2, and then, you know, doing, um, the NWA weekend. And then now, um, and then the week before that, and after that was my birthday. So I'm 28 now. (laughs) So as it stands, so I'm just really happy with everything and, the sky is the limit now and I'm just rooting for everybody you know in this wrestling journalist landscape because wrestling changes so much but a part of the reason why people can keep up with it is because of us you know people who document everything and keep up with everything so this is a big ups to us for holding it together this weekend and actually holding you know each other up and encouraging uh, um each other like it was just a fantastic weekend and being able to walk down the street and see wrestlers and say hi and stuff like that. Like, I can't believe this is my life. I cannot believe that this is my life. Um, Cause it's like, I tell people all the time, like I record this podcast on my phone or on my computer in my room, in my parents' house. And (laughs) I just feel like sometimes that this is this is really big and that it should be happening to somebody else. But, you know, it's like um, since I am a woman of faith, I believe that we are created for such a time as this. So I'm trying to, you know, bask in it and just enjoy the ride for what it is and continue to give great content. So. Like I said at the beginning of this, that was my experience with NWA Weekend with 73 and Empower. And I hope, you know, that more events like Empower can continue to happen every year and not just be like a one-off thing that people just do for um, the sake of views or for the sake of, you know, well, women's empowerment is going on. Let's just do this and just slap something together and then never have it again like Hint Hint WWE did. Um... I want more exposure for the women. Um, And if there can be more um, all-female events like this every year, and if it doesn't come from WWE, that's fine too, because you have like places like the Belladonna division now, and then you have NWA now, and so many, and you have Mission Pro Wrestling, shout out to them, that's um, thinking about pulling something together. And even there's an all-female promotion getting together in Seattle, that followed me on Twitter today. Like, there's so many places, you know, where you can watch all female wrestling, even Ring of Honor, you know? Like, wrestling is not just relegated to just the WWE just because it's the most accessible. So, um, I'm challenging you guys to support all kinds of wrestling, but definitely continue to support women's wrestling as a whole. And continue to press for more all-female products as well because you know the future is female we up in here we have the ability so let's go like let's do it um and I'm also challenging WWE to look into having more all-female things as well um because they kind of just had evolution one time and then just dropped it off and that's not cute and then I'm going to talk more about it later in the weekly recap on SmackDown, but they just need some help. But all in all, you know, um, continue to just support um, women's wrestling as a whole and continue to support the NWA because they have really great wrestling as well. So please support NWA, support women's wrestling and also support um, women's wrestling talk. You know, that's where I do lots of live tweeting and lots of interviews and lots of news stuff as well. Follow women's wrestling talk on um, Instagram at WW talk pod and on Twitter at WW talk pod too. And, you know, check out what we've got going on in our YouTube channel where all of those interviews that I did are. Um, and also a lot of the interviews that Emily did, um, 
um, that Emily did for All Out and some of her footage from All Out as well um, for AW. Please check that out. And just, you know, continue to support and follow um, Women's Wrestling Talk. And where you can also watch us every other Wednesday on Fight TV. So please check that out. We have great interviews and such with so many great people. So great women. So please check that out. Yeah, and that's the end of this segment. That's the end of my time in St. Louis, which is a beautiful city. So yeah, the future's bright, guys. All right, so it's the return of the weekly recap. Return of the recap. Return of the recap. <laughs> Not, re- yeah, okay, I'm sorry. So, this is the recap for Monday Night Raw. And of course, I'm going to start with talking about the women because ladies first, always. So, on Raw, we had a tag team match. Between Nikki Ash and Rhea Ripley versus Natalia and Tamina, who are the WWE Women's Tag Team Champions. This was awkward for me a little bit because I took a break last week because it was my birthday week. And it was just like to see them together after them, you know, just having fought each other for the Raw Women's title, which both of them, you know, don't have now, which is irritating to me because you know charlotte and the whole horse women thing that i did talk about on my last episode um now they're a tag team and now they're fighting against you know the women's tag team champions at this point and it's okay but i would prefer if if both of them tried to go after charlotte now but that's not what's happening and i'm kind of okay with it but we'll see so this match was actually pretty good they gave a promo beforehand which kind of gave off the impression that yeah they may not have everything in common with each other but you know once they put those aside put those differences aside that they're able to you know come together and become you know almost a nightmare so yeah um they're still trying to find their groove but they're cute so it's okay so nikki ash you know was using her speed to avoid tamina um because of course she's a powerhouse but you know she sat her on the top turnbuckle and then delivered a headbutt then rhea ripley tagged in and used um nikki ash as a weapon to take tamina down and then a slugfest broke out between the two before natalia came in and it was pretty cool to see you know somebody you know these two powerhouses go up against each other you have the og powerhouse in tamina and then you have basically the new age powerhouse in rhea so that was cool but then nikki ash tagged in and then ripley used her as a weapon again and then we returned from a commercial break um to see rhea ripley building up ahead of seam and then natalia missed a tag you know and it just seemed like they were natty and tamina were a little bit disjointed here you know in their chemistry and then rhea hit the riptide for the win so they're giving off the impression that maybe rhea and nikki might be going after the tag titles i don't know we'll see but by all means i also feel like Shotzi and tegan um knox should be going after the tag titles too because they've pinned um natty and tamina a couple of times on smackdown as well so i feel like they should just do a triple threat with all three of them fighting for the title and just call it a day but you know (sighs) that's just a wish of mine also with the women you had charlotte flair versus nia Jax for the raw women's championship and this came because last week because i because i couldn't avoid it anywhere um last week we saw nia jackson charlotte fighting each other in a non-title match but they got into like a real life scuffle like they really were scrapping in the ring like full on and they were getting irritated with each other there was one point where nia you know almost dropped charlotte in a very unsafe way and charlotte was pissed about it they were slapping each other and then Nia wound up coming out the victor in that match. So this was them having this championship match on Raw to sort of, you know, feed more into that, which is, you know, a smart move for them to do. So this match was actually pretty um, OK for the most part. So um, Charlotte and Nia had chances to give, you know, quick interviews or whatever before their matches. And then Shayna Baszler taunted Nia Jax because she was out there with her in her corner you know for the umpteenth time and um 
she taunted Nia Jax a little bit before the match and allowed Charlotte to go after her from behind. And they tried to recreate some more of the tension and stuff, you know, with trash talking and slaps to the face yet again. Um, and then Charlotte rolled out of the ring and acted like she wasn't going to, she was going to let herself be counted out. But Nia grabbed her by the hair and brought her back in for a clothesline. Then Charlotte went after her um, knee to soften up, soften her up for the figure eight. But Nia countered and ran her into the turnbuckle, which looked kind of bad there. Like she ran her into the oof. Like it just looked really bad when it happened. I was like, ouch. Um, but then Charlotte hit a power bomb from the corner for a close two count. And then we returned from commercial break to see Nia being thrown in into the ring post and out to the floor. And then Charlotte climbed up to the top rope and hit one of her signature moonsaults to take Nia down. But then Shayna Baszler almost hit Nia Jax by mistake, but then they caught themselves. So it was, yeah, that was what was, that's, that's basically what was happening. Then, um, Shayna got on the apron and distracted Nia before hitting, before Charlotte was able to hit natural selection from the middle rope to win the match and retain her title. And Nia was looking really angry and irritated at Shayna because at the beginning, Shayna was saying that she feels like she could beat Charlotte for the title and not Nia. So it seems like even though she was out there in her corner, she really wasn't in her corner. So now they're planting more seeds for them to possibly break up um, yet again. And I feel like if they're really going to break them up, then they really need to commit to it because I'm ready to see Shayna Baszler, you know, be sort of who she was in NXT or who she was when she first debuted when she was you know posing herself as a threat to Becky Lynch because before of course Becky Lynch beat her and then had to give up the title because she was having her baby and stuff like I'm ready to see Shayna Baszler be Shayna Baszler but you know who knows what's going to happen with that and so as Charlotte was celebrating Alexa Bliss um interrupted her and invited her to put to Alexa's playground, but then Charlotte turned her down. And Bliss was like, oh, that's too bad. And I guess we'll have to bring the playground to you. And then um, it got dark. And then Alexa Bliss popped up into the ring holding her doll. And then, you know, Charlotte was looking kind of like, girl, what are you doing here? And then she asked um, Bliss what she wanted. And she was like, what do you want for me? What do you want for me, Alexa? And then Alexa pointed at the Raw Women's title. So we're getting Alexa Bliss versus Charlotte. And even though we've gotten this before um, in the past, it's like now this is a totally different Alexa Bliss here. Um, Charlotte is, of course, you know, Charlotte Flair. She is the opportunity, right? But you have little Miss Alexa Bliss, who's no longer the goddess. She's kind of like the goddess of terror (laughs) and she has all these magic powers and lily by her side you know to her you know advantage so who knows you know what would happen you know i wouldn't mind seeing alexa bliss with the title but quite frankly i would have just preferred if rhea ripley or nikki ash you know proceeded to um go after the raw women's title that they just lost um at SummerSlam yet again because i feel like they should WRB should be doing a better job of um setting up their future women who aren't a part of the horsewomen you know they should be doing a better job of that but it seems like they've just sort of dropped the ball on the future and just seem to be focused more on the past so yeah that's pretty much all that really happened with the women aside from a backstage segment with Dewdrop, aka Piper Niven talking about how she um wants to teach a lesson to Eva Marie because they've officially broken up now so that was pretty good so that's pretty much all that went on with the women now with the men however um Raw was a pretty good show involving the men because this sort of started at the beginning of the show with a tag team turmoil match um and this was basically where each of the teams you know, we're giving, they were giving backstage promos and the thing about the tag team turmoil matches, you have to fight through all these different matches, which are kind of like a gauntlet, um, where you're fighting through all these different matches and whoever, you know, comes out the winner, you know, gets this chance at the tag team titles and whoever loses the match gets eliminated from the gauntlet. So it was pretty good here. Um, so when the show started, 
Randy Orton and Matt Riddle, the Raw Tag Team Champions, came out and gave their thoughts on it. And then um, Bobby Lashley at MVP joined them and wanted payback for the RKO that he gave to him last week. Then um, Bobby Lashley challenged Orton to a singles match, and then Orton said he would accept it on one condition. And the condition was he wants it to be for the WWE Championship. MVP took Bobby aside and then asked and then said that the that that match would happen at Extreme Rules, but then Lashley added they were going to get into the turmoil match, you know, to be able to take away the tag team titles from them because Bobby Lashley said he's greedy. So, yeah, everybody wants to be two belts, you know. So, yeah. Um so the tag team turmoil match started with the new day that's Kofi and Xavier versus um the Viking Raiders Eric and Ivar. Um Kingston basically took con- he took control before Ivar crushed him with a seated senton and then after a back and forth exchange um Xavier Wood scored the win with an inside cradle and then um Jinder Mahal and Veer were up next and um Kofi and Xavier tried to get the upper hand right away by attacking them during their entrance. And then Xavier hit a huge crossbody to Mahal for a close two count. Um, but Gender Mahal and Veer were dominating throughout the commercial break. But then Xavier and Kofi were able to hit a midnight hour to get another win. And here you can kind of tell they were getting a little bit tired, of course, because when you fight multiple matches back to back and having to face your opponent, you know, in the next gauntlet, it's like, you know, you're tired out, but you're still trying to, you know, maintain your endurance here. But the New Day was doing a pretty good job. They, I thought that they were going to go to distance. So they went on to face Lucha House Party um, with a pair of, and Lucha House Party met them at ringside with a pair of moon salts. And then Grand Metalik and Lindsay um, stayed on Xavier Woods with quick tags and double team spots. But then somehow Xavier managed to get a counter a move and get a third victory. It seemed like Xavier Woods was basically the MVP of this whole tag team turmoil match thing. Like it was really good. Then he had then they really didn't have time to celebrate because they had to face Mace and T Bar, which was probably the most imposing opponents that they had in this thing. Um, Mace and T-Bar basically took advantage of them um, with their wear and tear. And then Xavier managed to squeak out with a win with a surprise roll-up. But then after they won, Mace and T-Bar did not take kindly to it and basically beat up on both of those dudes before they were set to leave. And they were just angry about them lose, about themselves losing. So they took their frustrations out on them before Mustafa and Mansoor came out to um, face the New Day. Mansoor tried to help fight off Mace and T-Bar while uh, Mustafa was telling him, you know, no, like, let's fight them. Like, let's just forget about that. And um, Ali eventually tried to help his partner, but he ended up getting taken out, too. And Mace and T-Bar used the steps to dish out some extra punishment to um, Mansoor and Mustafa, too. So it was just like, dang. So after all of this ended, Sonya Deville and Adam Pearce came out and announced that the two teams would be given some time to recover, you know, after they sent um, Mason T-Bar backstage and said that they will finish up with AJ Styles, Omos, and Lashley and MVP. So as the show was getting close to the end, it felt more like a full circle, you know, sort of bookended moment there, um, which is something that WWE doesn't usually do a whole lot of sometimes. Like, they'll do, like they'll have like a completely different main event that doesn't even necessarily fit like the first part but this felt like a pretty good book in here so it was great um and i'll give them credit for that so as the show was getting ready to end um kofi and xavier came out to continue the gauntlet and mustafa and kofi started off with a basic lockup into a wrist lock and let me just say that somebody on twitter mentioned the fact that um that they didn't ever have their chance to have that little feud they had from Mustafa being mad that Kofi basically took his opportunity at the WWE championship and they're right like WWE literally had gold in their hands and threw it away for what but that seems to be the running theme there this week but I'll get more into that later um Mustafa tagged himself in when Mansoor took pity on an injured Xavier because Mansoor is a sweetheart 
Um, Kofi was able to tag himself in and give Xavier a breather. And then he hit Mustafa with a trouble in paradise before Xavier hit a huge flying elbow for the win. So this is where you really think that Kofi and Xavier are going to win this thing, right? (sighs) No. Here comes the one-sided part. AJ Styles and Omos came out um, as Kofi and Xavier looked like they was too tired to go. And then AJ Styles was firmly in control of Xavier Woods after a commercial break. And then every time Xavier tried to come in and make a comeback, Styles and Omos were able to stop him. And Omos um, helped AJ hit the Styles Clash to eliminate the New Day. And it's just so unfair because even though they were not afraid of Omos and his seven foot behind, you just can't beat up somebody who's just a powerhouse and seven feet tall. It's just so not fair, but that's just how it went. But they did a really good job. And kudos to Kofi and Xavier for being the tag team stalwarts that they are. So we don't know what's next for them. But either way, they're stars and they're amazing. Black excellence. Then Lashley and MVP, more black excellence, were the final participants. And they came out looking ready to fight. And then Bobby Lashley slammed um, AJ Styles who could take control of the match right away. And then once Omos tagged in... The crowd came alive because they were looking at the possibility of you got really big, strong and really tall Omas going up against powerhouse um, almighty Bobby Lashley. Right. And just watching them, you know, connect. It was something magical there. I can't really explain what it was, but the people in the crowd saw it and I felt it when I was looking. I was like, dang, this is ooh, like there was just something magical about it. Right. And then they locked fingers for a test of strength. And then Bobby, I thought there was a point where Bobby Lashley was going to lift up Omos for like a suplex, but he didn't. Um, And then he kicked Omos in the gut and then backed him to the corner um, for some shoulders to the body. But like I said, he tried to suplex it one time, but then Omos reversed it and then dropped him on his face. And when I tell you I would have died if Bobby Lashley picked up that man, I would have died. Like, I was sitting in a chair waiting. And then when it didn't happen, I was like, oh, God. Ooh, Jesus. But either way, it was cool. Um, Then Lashley and Randy had a confrontation that was broken up when AJ Styles took out the both of them. And then Omos um, threw Matt Riddle into the barricade because Riddle and Randy were out there watching the match. You know, of course, seeing who their next um, opponents was going to be. And then um, Omos threw Riddle into the barricade while MVP was taken out by AJ Styles. And Lashley cut AJ Styles in half with a spear to get the win. Which basically means that Lashley is going to battle Orton for the WWE title. And then they're calling them the Hurt Business, but they're not the real Hurt Business to me. Because it's not the Hurt Business without Shelton Benjamin and Cedric Alexander. But you got MVP and Lashley facing RK bro for the tag titles um but then Omos hit Bobby Lashley for a two-handed chokehold slam before he left for AJ and then Randy Orton finished Lashley off with an RKO out of nowhere to end the show so that was just a really good you know the tag team turmoil thing was really good um and I appreciated all the action so that was cool then you had Sheamus versus Drew McIntyre yep there was still more show in the middle of all this um so this was this was like after the turmoil match there was this um united this was for the united states championship and to be the number one contender to face damian priest so sheamus you know still had his protective mask on and then he offered a handshake in jest because him and drew mcintyre used to be best buds but then they broke up so that happened um and then drew mcintyre you know flipped him off and then they locked up and fought for control until Sheamus wrestled McIntyre down in a headlock. And then they took turns running running each other over with shoulder tackles before Drew hit a few chest chops in the corner. And then Sheamus hit a few of the 10 beats of the Baudrin, Um, But McIntyre countered and then gave him a taste of his own medicine. Um, and then Sheamus dropped down to hang him on the top rope before hitting a flying clothesline from the top rope to the floor. Then Drew hit a spine buster out of nowhere from a two count. And this is where they went to commercial. Then they came back from commercial to see um, Drew McIntyre taking control. And then he hit a belly to belly suplex from the top rope for a two count. This is where I thought it was going to be over, but no. Um, 
Drew then lined up for the bro kick, but then he, um, well, not Drew. Sheamus lined up for the bro kick, but then he ran to a clothesline from Drew. And then Drew ran him into the ring post before applying a Kimura lock. And then Sheamus barely made it to the bottom rope to force a break. And then he drilled McIntyre with a knee to the face for a near fall. But then Drew hit Sheamus with his own version of white noise for another two count. And this is where he ripped Sheamus' mask off because, of course, Sheamus' face is broken, quote unquote. Um, And then when he went for the Claymore, Sheamus rolled him up with a handful of tights for the win. So now Sheamus is now the number one contender for the U.S. title. Now, Damian Priest and him are going to fight, I believe, at Extreme Rules. So there we go with that. So that was a good match. I feel like when those two get together, they can never really have a bad match. Um, so it was still entertaining to look at. So that was pretty solid. Then we had Karrion Cross versus John Morrison. John Morrison is kind of floundering because at first he was starting off with a beef with the Miz, but then the Miz got casted for Dancing with the Stars. So now he's gone. Um, so now John Morrison is just kind of there doing his moist TV show. And so with this episode, you know, he was asking Karrion Cross some questions, but Karrion Cross was like, he was not here for it. He just kept staring at him in a very evil way. And he was just talking to John Morrison, talking about like he was going to destroy him. And John Morrison was looking like, bro, I really don't want you to destroy me. But Karrion, you know, already has his mission intact. So this happened. And Karrion Cross basically took control um, almost immediately. And nearly won within a minute with the cross jacket submission. But then Johnny made it to the bottom rope to force a break. But then he sprayed Karrion Cross with a drip stick. And it made him, it made Karrion Cross get even angrier than he already was. And then he threw John Morrison over the ring post to the floor. And it was very vicious too. Like he just tossed him like he was just a doll. I was like, dang. And then. He brought Morrison back in the ring and then reapplied the cross jacket for the submission win. And even though this is good for Karrion Cross to look dominant since he's new to Raw and everything, he's no longer on NXT. It's just, dang, what's going on with John Morrison? Like, he deserves something better. And I don't know. I don't know. I just feel like he deserves something better. And maybe he's not going to get that until The Miz is, um off of dancing with the stars but dance with the stars hasn't even started yet so i don't know but john morrison needs something else and he does i just feel like i just don't want him to like keep losing so yeah then we had reggie versus akira um tozawa for the 24 7 title and it's always impressive to see reggie you know hop up in the ring um, well, flipping the ring and stuff, like, it's really cool. Like, I feel like he's a really good athlete in terms of what he can do, considering he was in Cirque du Soleil and stuff like that. And actually getting to know him more and him talking about, you know, himself from a real place as opposed to being, like, the snotty um, sommelier that we knew him was, that, that we knew him by at first, and getting in women's business, which was irritating me. You know, him as a champion and him as an athlete on his own merit is actually something I can um, be a part of. And I'm good with that. So they had this match. And then Reggie used his unique brand of offense, you know, to score the win in about a minute. But then our truth ran down. And then he was followed by Cedric Alexander, whom but the Carrillo. And even Jeff Hardy (laughs) was running after the 24-7 title, too. But then Reggie managed to avoid everybody until Drake Maverick appeared on Raw for, like, the first time in forever. And he appeared behind him, and then he he didn't do anything um, as Reggie and Truth ran past him. And everybody was freaking out because Drake Maverick is here again. Like, what the heck? Like, it's so cool. Um, So... He's back, and that was amazing. So that's pretty much all that happened on Raw. So now I'm going to recap AEW. I watched the whole episode. I'm proud of myself. 
Okay, so I was sitting with my friends one day and they asked me, Stephanie, how do you record your podcast? And I said, with the Anchor app on my phone. And they were like, are you serious? I'm like, yeah, it's that simple. It is absolutely free. There are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone and your computer. And it will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and many more. You can also make money from the podcast with no minimum listenership. And it's got everything you need to make a podcast in one place. They even have classes and stuff that you can listen to that will give you all kinds of good tips on what you need to do in order to make the best podcast. So if you want to do this, download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. That's anchor.fm or download the free Anchor app to get started. All right, so now we have a recap of AEW, and this is sort of a mixture of different things because AEW has like a thousand different shows. So I'm going to recap a little bit of what I saw in terms of AEW Dark. Um, freaking Big Swole defeated Diamante in a three strikes match. And that was amazing. And I was happy that she had that moment. And I'm happy that a lot of people on... um. Twitter were sort of pushing to watch her match because they felt like that match belonged on Dynamite because they're really pushing for more representation of black wrestlers on AEW because it seems like a lot of the people who get put on the main TV show are people who aren't necessarily of color outside of the Lucha Brothers or outside of someone like Andrade. So we were really, you know, putting our gas behind um, Big Swole in her match because it um, main evented AEW Dark this week. And it was really, really good. And I definitely recommend that you go and watch it because it was really good. So the episode I'm going to recap the most of, though, is AEW Dynamite this past Wednesday. And of course, I'm going to start with the women. So Ruby Soho, um, who is formerly known as Ruby Riot in WWE, if you may or may not know, she's on AEW now and she made her debut during the um, Casino Battle Royale at AEW All Out. So now she is all in with All Elite. So she had her first match on Dynamite with Jamie Hayter, who has aligned herself with um, the AEW Women's World Champion, Dr. Britt Baker, DMD, because she's a real dentist, and Rebel. So Jamie Hayter is actually becoming one of my favorites as a powerhouse. Um, and I and with this forbidden door mess, I really feel like her and Jordan Grace should fight. But, you know, we'll see. So <laughs> Jordan Grace is from Impact. They should fight. I don't care what anybody says. Let them fight. Um, so Ruby made her in-ring, de- in-ring Dynamite debut. Um, and she wound up winning the Casino Battle Royale and earning a shot at the AEW Women's title. Um, and she was in a final two. She was in the final two with Thunder Rosa. And that was really good. And um, Thunder Rosa did a phenomenal job. And I really wish that she had won. Because to be honest, I feel like if any woman, you know, has, you know, credence to go after the women's title that Britt Baker currently has, it's her. Like, she's been helping a lot you know, with AEW's women's division. So how come you haven't given her an opportunity at the women's title? Give her a chance. Like, I'm tired of y'all sleeping on her and not giving her a chance. She's all elite now. Give her a chance, but whatever. Um, She had to face... Ruby had to face Jamie Hayter. So Jamie dominated the action throughout the um, commercial break, putting Ruby on the defensive. That ended with a DDT that she hit on her. And then um, Jamie hit a modified face buster. And then, um, well, no, I'm sorry. Ruby hit a modified face buster. But then Jamie um, delivered a backbreaker across the knee that looked really fierce. But then Ruby answered with eat defeat and scored the hard fight victory. And then after the match, um, Britt Baker attacked Ruby and tried to and tried to give her the um, curb stomp onto the AEW women's title, but then Riho um, and Chris Statlander came to um, Ruby Soho's rescue and basically set up for them to have a trios match 
with those three on um rampage and that was really good too like rampage was last night so that was really good as well so it was really good to see them you know have keep that continuity going between the two shows there and it's a shame and let me just also say that i feel like it's a shame that last night was the that that trios match between um team soho and team um dmd was the only women's action that i saw in terms of women fighting in a ring last night as opposed to on smackdown where really the only women's action that we saw well it wasn't even action but women's segments that we saw was bianca belair signing a contract for becky lynch's and becky lynch signing a contract for their match at extreme rules that is a shame that it is 2021 and WWE is supposedly doing this women's revolution and you have two of the best women, you know, getting ready to fight each other, you know, and they did a contract signing, but the rest of the women don't get any television time. Where they do that at? Like the only women's action I saw last night was on AEW and I hope that they don't forget that. And I have more to say about that in the SmackDown segment, but please, that, that was just trash. Um, so that's pretty much all that happened with the women on AEW. So going to the men, you had Dustin Rhodes, the natural, who's formerly known as Goldust, versus Malachi Black, who was formerly known as Aleister Black in WWE. Um, so Malachi weathered an early onslaught by Dustin Rhodes in the opening contest, and then he drove him through the timekeeper's table to halt his momentum. And then from there, um, he targeted the lower limbs of his opponent cutting him down and negating the size advantage and even though um and Dustin Rhodes here was basically fueled by the lack of respect that Malachi Black has shown him and his family because of course Malachi Malachi had just beat Cody Rhodes a couple weeks ago out of nowhere um nobody was expecting that so that's going on and then Dustin fought back and then downed um, Malachi with a big clothesline And then Malachi retrieved the boot that Cody um, took off during his tease retirement after their match and then taunted Dustin with it, which was horrible. But, you know, mind games. Then Dustin responded with a destroyer suplex that nearly um, ended his opponent's um, record that's undefeated now. But then Malachi sent Dustin into an exposed ring post and just barely caught him with black mask for the win. And it seems like commentary is finding, is having a hard time calling the Black Maz, you know, a new name because they'll just call it a kick or that kick or something. Like, it's like, I really want them to come up with a new name for it because it's almost like they're trying to avoid calling it the Black Maz for whatever reason. But this match was pretty good. Then you had CM Punk coming out to talk to the fans. Now, CM Punk did win his first match at AEW All Out against Darby Allin. And this thing still got it. CM Punk still got it, even after seven years. Um, And he seemed like he shocked even himself when he won the match. Because even after he won, he was saying, you know, seven years, you know, he just kept holding up his, his hands to say seven. And he was just really happy. So he hit the ring and he was still happy about his win from Darby Allin. And he hyped up the additions to the AEW roster and Adam Cole and brian danielson formerly known as daniel bryan and stuff and then he talked about you know himself beating darby allen and thanked him and sting and then said hello to linda pillman and the rest of the pillman family in the row because brian pillman jr is a part of the AEW roster and they're of course the family of loose cannon brian pillman who's sadly no longer with us um but they're all from cincinnati so they were all there so when he started talking about what's next for CM Punk, Taz interrupted him because not only is he a commentator, but he's also a heel manager from what I'm understanding. And they had a contentious back and forth because Taz was saying, I'm sick of you calling me out and calling out members of my team out saying you want to fight us and all this other stuff. I'm sick of you and blah, 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 blah. And all this love fest. I'm tired of it because you're fake and all this other stuff. And then Punk dared Taz to send out Ricky Starks and um and Hook and um Powerhouse Hobbs. And he said, Beat me if you can, survive if I let you. 
and he was playing on Taz's um, career-long catchphrase as they ended the confrontation. And they had a little bit of a stare-off, and I'm saying, like, what could be going on here? It was still interesting. And if it's one thing CM Punk can do, it's like he'll talk his face off and make you interested in him. He's he's the cult of personality, just like in his song. So, I mean, God, like, CM Punk is back, and every time he comes on TV, I just get happy because I just never thought this would happen. So, here we are. So then after that, we had Dante Martin versus Powerhouse Hobbs. Or as my friend Sir Wilkins would say, Hobbs. Like, he's just really happy about him. And he just, he says his name with extra oomph and it's funny. Shout out to Jobber Tears. So, um, moments after being challenged by CM Punk, Powerhouse Hobbs battled top flights Dante Martin. So this is my first time really seeing Dante Martin um, fight. So powerhouse Hobbs overpowered Martin at every turn so catching and then he caught him during a top a top suicida attempt and then sent him into the rain post and he controlled the pace grounding his smaller high-flying opponent throughout the break like it was almost like watching a giant animal play with like a small toy it's just like you know he's the toy is going to get broken somehow um then Martin exploded back into the match dropping Hobbs with a shotgun drop kick and then added in a standing senton. And then he flew over an interfering hook and wiped his larger opponent out on the floor. But Hobbs um, caught his opponent and drove him into the mat with a spine buster with an emphatic victory. So I feel like this is good because if CM Punk is going to be facing him next, then he has to, you know, be able to show his strength here. So that was good. Um, so, yeah. Then after that, MJF came out and talked for for like the first time since his loss at All Out against Chris Jericho. This match had high stakes because if Chris Jericho had lost this match, he would never wrestle again. So this was basically like a retirement match. But Chris Jericho wound up winning because even though there was a point where the referee, um, Aubrey, didn't see um, him grab the rope at the bottom, grab the bottom rope to break the count, the ref, another referee came in and saw it, and then they restarted the match, and Chris Jericho won. So MJF was pissed, and so he came out there alongside Wardlow and wasted a little time making excuses for his loss at Chris, loss to Chris Jericho at All Out, and he was talking trash on the Cincinnati fans, and there were, I think there was one point where he called Cincinnati, excuse my French, shit Cincinnati, and that was really harsh. And then he insulted the Pillman family and it was just so bad. And I was just like, oh, like the things he was saying, like there was one point where he was talking about how Brian Pillman, he was talking about Brian Pillman Jr.'s mom. And that was really horrible because his mom had been through some stuff like drug stuff and all that from Dark Side of the Ring and stuff like that. If you watch that episode, like their family had really been through some trying times. So to insult them was just kind of a low blow even though I know that's MJF's MO that doesn't make it attractive and that was just kind of hurtful um to listen to and he continued to talk about how his mom should have swallowed before and all this other stuff and it was just like oh my god MJF please be quiet stop it stop it stop it stop it stop it (sighs) but um Brian Pillman Jr. came out there and Um, he gave emphatic orders to Wardlow to beat him up, but then Wardlow, but then he also inserted, he also insulted Wardlow too. And I'm just like, isn't Wardlow on your side? He was basically saying like, yeah, help me the way that you should have helped me in that match with Chris Jericho. But yet he was still coming to MJF's defense. And I'm saying here like, so are you just MJF's bitch? Because that's not cool. Like, you shouldn't be taken up and fighting for the person who just insulted you. Like, that's not cool. So, Wardlow saved him by driving Pillman down with a German suplex and then flattened Griff Garrison with a lariat clothesline. And then the heels, you know, stood tall, you know, while closing out the segment. And, yeah, that just, that kind of bummed me out a little bit to see Brian Pillman, you know, get junior, get knocked down in his hometown like that in front of his family. But, eesh, MJF needs, he needs Jesus. <laughs> like, MJF just needs Jesus. He needs Jesus. And that's all I have to say about him. Um, 
Then there was the six-man tag team match with the Dark Order versus the Pinnacle. And that's FTR and Sean Spears with Tully Blanchard. And the Dark Order members were, that were fighting was Evil Uno, John Silver, and Stu Grayson. And I find myself getting more and more impressed with John Silver the more I see him. So um, this match was, it was pretty okay. Um, there's a lot of dissension with the Dark Order now. Like they don't have really have like a leader leader. Um since of course the passing of Brody Lee and rest in peace to him and much to the frustration of Anna J who did make her return at all out she was telling them that they really need to stop fighting and get themselves together but it doesn't seem like they've really ironed out their issues so they're they were never on the same page throughout this match so even when they had momentum on their side um with John Silver uncorking a series of kicks to the body of Dax Harwood um Grayson got tagged in, which led to a Death Valley driver by um, Sean Spears for the win. And then after the match, the Dark Order came to blows, shoving each other in disagreement, while Anna Jay and Ty Conti watched from the ramp. And yeah, I don't know why they just keep imploding and fighting each other. But hopefully, you know, that'll be fixed at some point. Then we have Brian Danielson coming out and interrupting the elite. So... Tony Schiavone welcomed the elite to the ring. And of course, you know, almost immediately the Young Bucks introduced Adam Cole with them, you know, to make his own entrance. And um, he came out there and then he threatened Tony Schiavone over his friendship with Britt Baker and said, you know, if you ever say anything bad about Britt Baker or do anything to hurt her, you know, I will drop you where you stand or I'll hurt you or something like that. Like, and I'm just like, well we have our new heel couple. <laughs> I thought that was interesting because I mean, I want them to have segments together. Like I want all the couple things to happen. So whatever, they cute. So then um, he ordered him out of the ring and then called him a geek. He was like, get out of the ring. And then he cut like this braggadocious promo about the dominance of the elite over the sport, you know, and how he's going to take over and everything. But then Brian Danielson interrupted and it came face to face with Kenny Omega. Um, and Brian Danielson was making reference to the fact that Kenny Omega was voted number one um, with PWI's 500 list that came out this week. And he said, and then um, the champion asked for the ring and asked for privacy. But then Brian snatched the microphone for him and laid the gauntlet for a match between them for the AEW world title because he believes that he can beat him. And then he grabbed a hold of an arm bar before the elite jumped him. But then as they were jumping him, the Jurassic Express, Christian Cage, and Frankie Kazarian hit the ring and helped him out, you know, so he has those allies there. And then they beat beat up Brandon Cutler to close out the segment. So Brian Danielson versus Omega is something that I do want to see because they are amazing wrestlers. Like they really are. So I feel like seeing a match between those two for the AEW world title would be amazing. And if Dan and if Danielson did win, then that would be really cool. But I don't know. We'll see. Um I want Andrade to beat Kenny Omega for the AEW world title though, because because he was supposed to win the triple A title from him and then somehow another stuff got changed. So I feel like Andrade should be somehow or another be next in line. I know that's not really how that works. But in my perfect world, if I'm booking something, then I would want Andrade to go after the world title. Because Andrade was did participate in a match against Pac on Rampage last night. And that match was freaking fire. Like, it was really fire. And Andrade was able to show that he is still out here, you know, getting better at his abilities and just doing more. Like... This thing is a wrestling genius. Make him go for a title at some point, please. Even if it's even if it's just TNT or just more opportunities for Andrade, please. Either way. Then um, Dynamite ended with John Moxley versus Minoru Suzuki, which is a homecoming match because John Moxley is from Cincinnati. So he had his moment. Everybody was singing Wild Thing really loud. He deserves that. So. He sought revenge for the attack that he suffered at the hands of Minoru Suzuki at All Out. So they fought each other. And um, they, the John Moxley 
through punches and exchanged um, breathtaking clotheslines with each other. And then they was and he was stood a targeted attack by Suzuki on his arm. But in the end, Suzuki, with his eye bloodied from the intensely physical battle, succumbed to the paradigm shift as Moxley earned a grueling victory in front of his fans, family, and friends. So that's pretty much how that ended. And then John Moxley um, was in a segment last night, and I for I forgot what he was doing last night. I forgot what happened, but he ended that as well because they were still in Cincinnati for Rampage too. So that's pretty much all for AEW. I'm going to consistently, I'm going to try my best to consistently watch AEW more and more since everything is getting all kinds of lit right now in wrestling. So I'm going to just con- continue to watch AEW and probably cover it more and more, you know, as time goes on. Um, so it's kind of hard to keep up with a lot of things in wrestling because there's so much going on. But I'm going to try my best to give you AEW content more and more and learn more stuff the more I watch it. So now I'm going to recap SmackDown. All right. And for the last recap, we're going to talk about SmackDown. And of course, we're going to talk about the women or the lack thereof. Yeah, I'm about to go in and it's, and I try my best not to do this, but I'm going to have to do it this time. So, um, the one women's segment that they had on SmackDown last night, which emanated from Madison Square Garden on in New York City the day before September the 11th and the 20th anniversary of that terrible day. Um, Becky Lynch and Bianca Belair had their contract signing for their match at Extreme Rules for the SmackDown Women's Championship. So... Bianca Belair made her way to the ring looking like milk and her beautiful outfit with pearls in her hair and pearl earrings with hoops on. Girl, she just looked amazing. She looks amazing every day, but yeah, she just looked amazing last night. So um, she made her way to the ring and she was ready to sign a contract and she did just that um, after addressing the people and stuff and she signed it before Becky Lynch came out and made her presence felt marching to the ring with giant sunglasses and a beautiful red faux fur coat and when I tell you it it gave off man energy (laughs) like it reminded me of that time she came out in a yellow fur coat and had a crown on her head with sunglasses too like she's obviously a silly person who likes to troll people so I think this is what she was trying to do but the fur coat was cute and I'm not gonna sit here and pretend that I didn't like it just because I don't like the fact that she is the champion um because I really because honestly in my opinion I really feel like the only reason why Becky Lynch is champion right now is just made for the shock value of the fact that WWE wanted to compete with AEW with the whole shock thing of bringing CM Punk back that same weekend and nobody and then also the fact tie in the fact that Sasha Banks isn't there for whatever reason so they were trying to compete with AEW with the shock value thing and that's the only reason why Bianca Belair isn't champion right now I mean you can shoot me about it if you want to I don't care that's just how I feel um Becky Lynch should not be champion right now but she is so here we are um Becky even um decided to insult Bianca by saying that she was actually the real main event of WrestleMania and not Bianca. And that made me mad because she's sort of, you know, pushing the fact that she is a heel. But it made me mad because it made it seem like one main event was was more important than the other. And yeah, you may have been part of the very first women's main event, but let's be completely honest here. Bianca and Sasha is the WrestleMania main event that means the most. It means the most because it was the first time two black women ever main evented a WrestleMania. It takes like literally like it takes nothing for for white women to make history in some cases. But when it comes to black women making history and us being held back a lot of the time, even though women as a whole can be held back, it's even worse when you're a black woman because you have two strikes against you. So let's be honest here and be real about the fact that Bianca and Sasha actually means a little bit more than your main event. And that's another hot take for you guys. But whatever. 
if it makes people mad, then that's just how you feel. But to me, Bianca and Sasha will always be the main event to me. And that's not taking anything away from those girls, but still. Don't try to insult one main event and make it seem like it's less important than yours. Ma'am, stop it. Yours was not that... Yours was good, but stop. E- anyway, and she basically asked her, like, what happens if I don't sign the contract? Like, I don't have to do this. She just kept trying to, like, put, like, you know, back her way out of having this match with Bianca. And then she said... And then the fans actually started to boo her. And then she took exception to that. She said, you know, you know, when I was gone, all you guys did was chant, we want Becky while I was at home. And then she said that she was taking care of her baby, you know, and she came back for them and basically said, like, you know, I came back for y'all because y'all were chanting, we want Becky. And I basically saved SummerSlam and I saved you guys and all this other mess. And I'm sitting here like, so you said it. So you basically said that you saved WWE from, you know, sinking because they were sinking when it came to the shock of CM Punk being back and they needed something and you were that thing. So you've outright admitted it. Okay. I see you. I see what you did there. You saved them. You saved us. Whatever girl by, um, you didn't save us. You took away momentum from a, from a burgeoning superstar. That's what you did. But to be honest, Bianca Belair is like I said on women's wrestling talk news this past Thursday, Bianca is going to always be a star regardless of whether or not she has a title because the EST is a mindset. It's not something that's set in stone based off of how many titles you win. So whatever, either way, she reluctantly signed it and said, fine, if I'm going to sign this, then just know I'm going to beat you. And then she ducked out of the ring and raised her title in the air. And then she threw, and then she threw the contract at her after, at Bianca, after she signed it, but Bianca caught it. And I was just like, just call Bianca Mrs. Perfect. Just call her Mrs. Perfect. Just do it. She's Mrs. Perfect. I don't care what anybody says. She's athletically sound. She can lift people. She can catch contracts. Like she's Mrs. Perfect. And that's all I have to say. Um, I hope Bianca beats her ass. I'm sorry. I'm cursing, but I really hope Bianca beats her ass at Xavier at, um, not Xavier, but extreme rules. Just please just let it happen. Oh, and that's pretty much all that happened with the women because one match went on too long. Edge and Seth Rollins, that's the rumors that because that match went on too long, we didn't get to see a tag team match involving Liv Morgan and um, involving Liv Morgan um, and Zelina Vega and Carmella and maybe Naomi or another woman and stuff like that. And that disappointed me because the only other women that we saw was Shotzi and Knox antagonizing Paul Heyman. And that irritated me because you could have brought Zelina Vega out to fight in New York, like on the eve of September the 11th, where she lost her father and condolences for her and every other person that lost someone that terrible day. But you could have brought Zelina Vega out there in her home city and had her fight in a match with her um, beautiful Naruto inspired gear and you could have had her fight out there and would have had more women's action that night, but you didn't. And the only women's action that we got to see Friday night was from AEW Rampage. They dropped the ball on that. They absolutely dropped the ball on that. And WWE needs to be held responsible for that because you cannot just afford to show the women who are in the title picture and then just leave the rest of the women to do nothing because even they went on Twitter and had and were disappointed in that they could have had a moment Carmella could have had a moment Zelina could have had a moment Liv could have had a moment like all of those women could have had a moment in Madison Square Garden but you didn't allow them to and that's not fair in a world where we have empower and in a world where we have so many other places actually highlighting women's wrestling on like women's wrestling you can't afford to have to have no women's wrestling on your show on Smackdown which is arguably your highest rated show at this point Y'all can't afford for that to happen anymore. And y'all need to do better by your women. And that's all I have to say about that. So the show began with a tribute. Let me calm down. With a tribute 
to America on the eve of September 11th. And it was a very beautiful montage that they did where they had quotes from former President George Bush, who was president at the time. And then they also had quotes um, from President Barack Obama um, about it as well. So it was nice. It was very tasteful. The never forget montages were great. Those are always great. So it was tasteful and it was nice. So um, Roman Reigns, the Universal Champion, came out with the Usos, the SmackDown Tag Team Champions, and Paul Heyman. And um, Roman Reigns came out and cut a promo saying that he runs New York City and thus he runs the Madison Square Garden. And then he demanded that everybody in Madison Square Garden acknowledge him. And New York surprisingly did chant Roman and stuff like that. And they were acknowledging him because, I mean, Roman Reigns as a heel is amazing. But then Brock Lesnar's music came out and everybody was losing their entire mind. And he came out and got into the ring and Lesnar came face to face with Roman before um, cutting Paul Heyman off where he was about to ask him something. And then he said, I've got a question for you, Paul. Why didn't you tell Roman I was going to be at SummerSlam? And everybody was shocked like, <gasps> because what's been happening lately is the fact that Paul has been denying that he knew he was going to be there. He's been vehement, vehement, vehemently denying that he knew anything about Brock being at SummerSlam. But now it's almost coming out like Paul lied to Roman. And Roman was not happy about that. So the family left him. The bloodline left him behind. And... The advocate fired off his intro for Brock Lesnar um, that he would normally do before Brock backed him into the ropes. And he says, before Roman Reigns fires you, accept my challenge for the universal title. And Heyman hesitated to answer for him. So Lesnar said, look, you got five seconds. And he counted down them five seconds. And then he hoisted him on his shoulders for an F5. And I don't know if I ever thought that I would ever see Brock Lesnar F5 Paul Heyman I y'all gonna have to remind me and tell me if this has happened before because I just don't ever remember seeing that happen and I didn't think I would ever see that happen in my whole life but it really did and I was sitting there just shook like trying to process everything I was trying to see but before he was able to do the F5 Reigns saved him and gave him one Superman punch, but then he caught him in mid-flight. And then the Usos tried to make the save. Then Lesnar gave them a double um, clothesline. And he just stood tall to close out the opening segment. And it was fire. It was absolutely fire. I'm pretty sure those people at MSG got their money's worth, even though the, there were no women. But they still got their money's worth with that segment. It was really amazing. I loved it. Then we had a 10-man tag team match um, involving, like, so many people. <laughs> like, it had so many people in it. Like, it was a tag, it was a match between Apollo Crews, Otis, Dolph Ziggler, and Robert Roode to battle Ray and Dominic Mysterio, Big E, Rick Boogs, and King Nakamura, the Intercontinental Champion. So, Sami Zayn was out there, and he was dressed in these pajama pants and his wrestling boots and a New York Knicks jersey. And then he had on a Knicks jersey, but then he came out there and introduced a special guest to watch the match. And it was Atlanta Hawks star Trey Young. And when I tell you New York came unglued to boo that man, they really did. And I felt insulted by it. And I'm not even from New York or Atlanta. But I'm sitting here like, now why would you do this to this man? He might die tonight. Why? So, <laughs> um, it was just really funny here. So, and then Trey want, called himself wanting to get involved in the match. He wound up getting ejected by that referee. And I'm pretty sure that's the biggest pop that referee has ever gotten. Shout out to him because that was a good call. Um, so the match was very energetic. Um, and then there was a di this distraction by Trey Young. That allowed the Mysterios to deliver Stereo 619s and Big E to finish Sami Zayn with the big ending. And then Kayla Braxton, who was just like the MVP journalist of the whole night, because she was interviewing everybody, um, especially Paul Heyman and getting on his last nerves. Um, she interviewed Big E and asked him, you know, if New York fans might see him out there later tonight. Um, to try to take advantage and cash in his money in the bank contract on Roman or whatever. And he said, I don't know. You might see me on Monday Night Raw. 
um, with Bobby Lashley. He said, whatever the case, if you got what I need, you're going to feel my power. And honestly, I'm glad that he kept it a surprise because I don't, if he's going to cash in, I don't want him to do the John Cena thing and tell everybody when he's going to cash it in and then wind up losing. Like, Biggie losing money in the bank is not something that I'm able to handle or process. Not in a healthy way. I might just get angry if that happens. So I'm glad he kept it a surprise. So that was good. Then we had Edge versus Seth Rollins, too. And so Edge kind of gave off the impression on Twitter that this might be his last time fighting in the MSG. Um, I hope it's not personally, but, you know, it might be it for him. I don't know. We'll see. So Seth Rollins controlled the match. Um, heading into the commercial break, which was forcing Edge to sort of fight from underneath as if he wished to make it, you know, 2-0 and against the architect. And let me also say that I loved Edge's, Edge's and Seth Rollins' gear. Seth Rollins' gear was given Michael Jackson in Budapest, live in Budapest. Um, and Edge's gear was definitely given off Heart Foundation. And I love it. I love pink and black. You could just never go wrong with that. Um, shout out to Canada. So that was good. So um, he did a mounting of a comeback that saw him deliver a pedigree um, in honor of Triple H for a two count. And then there was a point during the match where Seth hit Edge with a glam slam twice to get in his head because Edge, of course, is married to Beth Phoenix, who was the originator of the glam slam, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, um, if you hear this. But yeah, like, and I said by, and I said on Twitter, by all means, if Edge winds up winning this match with a disarmor, I will laugh my behind off. But he didn't, and I'm mad. But it's okay. Um, also, let me just say, Seth came out there with a giant fur coat, and so did Becky. And y'all ain't slick. Y'all are, y'all are a matchy matchy couple, and I like that. So it's cool. Then following the commercial break, Edge trapped Seth Rollins in a cross face. Um, in this, with the same move that earned him to win in Las Vegas at SummerSlam. But this time, Seth Rollins made it to the ropes, necessitating a break. And then Rollins tried for the curve stop, but then Edge countered it with a sit-out powerbomb for another two. And then a spear moments later netted the same result. Then there was a low blow after Seth Rollins um, backed Jessica Carr, the referee, into a corner. He kicked him in the, in the happy part. And then he followed it up with multiple super kicks and then gave two more before yelling out, why won't you die? And then he kicked him again and then he gave him the curb stomp and then followed it up with a win. So Seth Rollins beat Edge, not clean, but he beat him. And then the ENTs came out and carried um, Edge, you know, in a um ambulance and stuff with Rey Mysterio you know saying supportive words to him or whatever you know and they were making it seem like this could be it for him and all that you know with the commentary table with them being serious and everything but I don't believe this is the last we've seen an edge because you can't you can't tell me Seth gonna he gonna let Seth do him like that no he better not let him do him like that and beat him with a low blow and then a couple kicks no edge better come back and get some revenge and that's all I that's all I'm saying So, um, and then Seth was looking disturbed, like he was ashamed of what he did or whatever. And I'm wondering, like, is this going to cause for a break? And we're, and are we going to get face Seth? Are we? I don't know. We'll see. So sadly, this SmackDown ended with the Usos versus Street Profits for the SmackDown Tag Team Championships. And this is no shade to them because I love them as a tag. As I loved this match and I love them, you know, fighting each other for the tag team titles. But y'all seriously could have made room for the women here. I'm not going to stop being mad at them for that. But, okay. And I was completely out of this match because I was mad at it. But we'll see. Also, they didn't feature Naomi, too. They didn't feature Naomi um, getting, trying to get in and talk to Sonya Deville about her plans and being ignored by her. But they put that on Twitter or whatever. But still, y'all didn't do that. Y'all didn't do right by them girls. Y'all need to do better. So, the Smack team, the SmackDown Tag Team Championships were on the line in the main event as the Usos defended against the Street Profits. So, this match was really solid. So... Each team had the opportunity to put an exclamation point on things, take into the air to wipe out the competition, head into a commercial break. 
Then um, back from the final break of the evening, Montez Ford delivered a jumping neck breaker to Jimmy Uso for a close two count, all while wearing one shoe. And in New York, they were chanting one shoe. <laughs> and even Bianca Belair tweeted a shoe. So that was really funny. So yeah, Montez Ford going to deliver regardless, shoe or not. So whatever. Then the Usos halted the momentum and by with Jay slowing down Angelo Dawkins with a super kick. And then two more super kicks were delivered. And an Uso splash from Jay um, delivered a near fall. They even had Roman Reigns worried that they weren't going to come through with the win. Then Jimmy missed another Uso splash. And then Montez Ford delivered his from the Heavens Frog splash. But somehow or another they kicked out of that. But then Roman's, Roman Reigns broke up the pin, which normally would have won the thing. Um, and then he applied the guillotine to Montez Ford as the referee called for the bell, which caused a disqualification, which means the Street Profits won the match but didn't win the titles. And I man, that made me a little bit mad because I love my Street Profits, but you know, bloodline. Um, so Roman Reigns was mad, so he grabbed a microphone and accepted Brock Lesnar's challenge from earlier in the night to face here another full circle moment. Um, to face um Brock Lesnar after he finishes facing Finn Balor. But then after he mentioned Finn Balor's name, the arena got dark, and then the red lights came on. And out came Demon Finn Balor. And I was so happy because we hadn't seen Demon Finn in like maybe two or three years. So I was just like, yes, Demon Finn. Yes. So he came out there and confronted Roman Reigns. So now Roman Reigns has to now deal as the head of the table now has to deal with a beast and a demon. He has problems, but I guess the head of the table can handle it. Right. Um, so, yeah, do better by SmackDown. Do better by your women. And that's all I have to say about SmackDown. That's the end. All right. Thank you guys so much for listening to this new episode of The Hardy Wrestling Podcast. As usual, you can follow me, your girl, Stephanie Hardy, on Instagram at Queen Steph Hardy. And on Twitter at Queen Steph Hardy as well. And you can follow the podcast pages at Hardy Wrestling Podcast on Instagram. And on Twitter at Hardy WrestlePod. Um, and you can like my Facebook page called The Hardy Wrestling Podcast as well. I be making posts of different clips and stuff. So please check it out. You can listen to the podcast on Anchor, Spotify, um, iHeartRadio, YouTube, and just many other places where you can get your podcast, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, just everywhere you get them. Listen to the show, like, share, and subscribe. Um, watch all of my interviews and stuff. And I may be starting a new segment where I'm going to be practicing commentary um, during the week and stuff if I find time and stuff. So I have lots of new interviews coming your way too because since I made so many connections these past couple weeks in my wrestling journeys as a commentator slash in, um, interviewer, we are going to have lots of interviews. So please support these interviews. I'm going to be posting the interviews themselves on my YouTube channel, the Hardy Wrestling Podcast channel. And they're going to be included in the episodes that I do over the next couple of weeks. So please check those out. Please support the podcast. Please support me. And if there's any other ideas that you might have, you know, for stuff that you want me to cover or talk about, you know, please do so. Or please DM me, you know, on the podcast pages and stuff like that. Or if there's anybody or if you know somebody like a wrestling fan that you want me to interview and stuff like that or a wrestling podcaster that you want me to work with, you can tell me that as well. And also don't hesitate to check me out on Women's Wrestling Talk as well. We do lots of cool stuff there um, for women's wrestling and just wrestling as a whole. So please check us out and everything we've got going on there. Um, Check us out on Fight TV every other Wednesday. And just, you know, check out any of the interviews that we had going on for NWA, AEW, and so many different things. I am really blessed to be a part of everything that's going on in wrestling right now. It's a crazy time, but it's a beautiful time. So with that in mind, I hope that you're being healthy and you're taking care of yourself. Because this Rona is still running around and running rampant and acting crazy. And I just hope that in terms of your mental and um emotional health you're taking care of yourself if you're going through something take it easy on yourself you know have mercy on yourself 
and just remember to surround yourself with love because ultimately that is all we need to survive um so with that in mind this is the hardy wrestling podcast with your girl stephanie hardy and until next time bye y'all